Hello, everyone, and welcome to Designers at Home. I'm Mark Weaver, and with me today is Dr. Gabriel Ritter. So welcome, Gabe. Hi, happy um, to be here. So for all of you, um, Dr. Ritter is the Director of Art, Design, and Architecture at the University of California in Santa Barbara. And he's joining us from the museum, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the museum, its two departments, and give us a tour. And we're going to be fortunate enough that he'll take us through and show us a current exhibition. So um, it's morning for you, Gabe, and probably a hot day in Santa Barbara. And it, is, it is getting up there. I think it's already for us, uh, you know, mid, mid to maybe high 80s. So uh, okay. uh, it's going to be a warm one. Well, I'm in Miami Beach working, and it's about 98 today and about 90% humidity. So I don't know, I don't know which is worse. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you, you might win on humidity. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's great to have you on the show today. So thank you for joining us. Oh, so, it's absolutely my pleasure. Before we get into um, talking about the, um, the architecture and art, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about your background, because sure. you're a California native. I, actually, you're I, a Los Angeles native, right? Born and raised in uh, West LA, Century City. Uh-huh. And uh, went, I mean, went to uh, UCLA for both my undergrad and uh, graduate degrees. And, you know, it, what's interesting is having grown up in L.A., my father had a fascination with Santa Barbara. And uh, even though we didn't live up here, I think we probably came to visit maybe at least once a month. So uh, growing up, you know, Santa Barbara was very much part of, you know, weekend uh, excursions and going to Joe's Cafe, Earthling Books, going to the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. Um, all these places uh, are really a part of, were part of my childhood. And so it's amazing to now be up here with my family uh, and now be part of the UC Santa Barbara family as well. Well, I'm sure they're thrilled to have you. So you also um, had moved from Los Angeles um, to, it was it um, Cincinnati? No, uh, so it took a, a ways to get, you know, the, the life of a curator is, is semi-nomadic. And so I was uh, in Los Angeles. Then I was actually living and working uh, in Japan as a doctoral research fellow uh, yes. for about a, a year. And then from there, I went straight to the Dallas Museum of Art, which is a fantastic uh, encyclopedic collecting institution. I was there for about five years. And then after Dallas, I, my most recent position was at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, right. uh, otherwise known as MIA. Right. And how did, how did it evolve into moving to Santa Barbara and being with the university there? Well, you know, um, it's, I, 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 we had done some amazing projects in Minneapolis. And I think uh, both my, you know, having this academic background, I, Believe it or not, even though I, I'm kind of a generalist as a curator, uh, my academic background is really on post-war Japanese art. And uh, they had, uh, you know, there was an opening here. Um, the previous director, who was also a longtime professor here, uh, Bruce Robertson, who I'm sure is familiar to many of your viewers, um, he was uh, retiring. And as the position opened, I, I applied. And, you know, a year or so later, uh, here we are. So that's that's how that came to be. Wonderful. So talk a little bit about um, your your time in Japan. You spent fourteen years in Japan. No, 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 no. I, I spent one 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 year in Japan. One but year. I, okay. I, I, I think the fourteen you get is uh, you know growing up in LA. There's a very unique relationship to um, the Pacific Rim, and so uh, actually at the age of fourteen. I, uh, it was called Lanska. Uh, it's the Los Angeles Sister City um, Nagoya Association. Nagoya is a, a wonderful city. Um, uh, it kind of in the center uh, of, of Japan. I'll actually be going there later this month for a, uh, talking about going full circle uh, for a conference uh, actually later this month. But at the age of 14, I, I did an exchange uh, with uh, a family in, and actually stayed at a school for, I think, three months. Uh, and so after that began this kind of uh, 
love affair slash a, a kind of a sustained interest in uh, Japanese arts and cultures, which uh, ha has continued. Um, my time in Tokyo, I was very fortunate to be at the National Gallery of Modern Art. This is the museum that is across the street from the Imperial Palace. And I was studying um, uh, quite obscure, but a, a gentleman named Kitawaki Noboru, and he uh, was a Japanese surrealist in the uh, 30s and 40s. And so looking mm -hmm. at art and the pressures during, during wartime Japan. And that's had a tremendous influence on your personal taste in, in art. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. That would be great. Okay. So um, at, the, at the university, you're not only the director, but you also curate and you also teach. Is that right? <laughs> that's right. I, I, wear, I wear several hats. Uh, I am the director of the Art Design and Architecture Museum, where we are today. Uh, I'm also associate professor in the History of Art and Architecture Department. Um, currently, I'm teaching uh, primarily museum studies courses, but hopefully at some point in the future, also teaching uh, Japanese art history. And as we'll see later today, uh, I am also the curator of the Ishi Glinsky uh, Upon a Jagged Maze exhibition. Great. And that's thrilling to see. I was fortunate enough on Saturday to visit you at the museum and... Um, you gave me a private tour. It was just really thrilling. Thank you for doing that. Oh, it was great having you up that here. With everybody that's watching today. So, um, so was there something that inspired you as a young person, um, your interest in art? How did that come about? You know, I think that's also very L.A. related. Uh, you know, my father was actually a, a city planner, lifetime city planner, but uh, I think at some, in some past life uh, had, had wanted to be an art historian. Mm -hmm. And so we would go to museums literally every weekend, whether it was MoCA, whether it was LACMA, whether it was the Getty um, and elsewhere. And that really left, you know, this kind of indelible mark on me, um, which I, you know, ho I hope now at the ADNA Museum we're able to, and also in my work as a curator, I hope that, you know, that kind of invitation or that welcome that exhibitions uh, provide to various audiences, you know, creating that relationship, that lifelong relationship uh, with museums. I hope I'm able to uh, continue that. But that's how uh, my interest in, in art really began. And then I think realizing um, that I could kind of create a community of like-minded individuals uh, supporting artists uh, that were my age and bringing them to a public and, and making their work known was, was and has been incredibly fulfilling. Wonderful. So under the umbrella of the uh, museum, there's two departments, the architecture and the fine arts division. Is that right? That's right. Uh, so I can give you a really quick uh, history of, of the museum. So the architecture and design uh, collection is one of two uh, permanent collections here at the Art, Design, and Architecture Museum at UC Santa Barbara. The museum was first established in 1959. Um, many of your viewers is pro are probably familiar with uh, David Gephardt, uh, the architectural historian, mm -hmm. um, very well known uh, for his, his books chronicling uh, both architecture and public art throughout Los Angeles. And in 1963, he created actually where uh, I am now, which is the architecture and design collection. And this uh, now constitutes, I believe, over 2 million architectural papers and models. Uh, and its purview is the built environment of Southern California uh, from 1900 until present. And it is one of the largest archives of its kind in the nation. And so you have architects coming from all over California, all over the country, we, to access these archives? We do, and actually, uh, if I'll turn the camera around, uh, you can see, so today I am in what is known as the jewel box, uh, and we actually have a researcher coming to see materials. This is by uh, Ella Crawford. I I'm sure maybe the picture is, is a bit dated, but uh, the place may still be familiar to many of your viewers. This is C Crossroads of the World. That's at 6665 yes. Sunset, yeah, yep. on, in Hollywood. Um, I think this, this main space may actually be a, a kind of panorama uh, of, uh, I know that there's an artist that uses 
uses this as an, uh, inst or has in the past as an installation space. So, so this is all from 1936. We have this photograph, uh, but we also have, you know, amazing original drawings by the architect, Ella Crawford. And you can see these original designs uh, for Crossroads of the World. And then just moving over here briefly, this beautifully illustrated, uh, um, this is actually a floor plan, but you can see here maps of the crossroads of the world, California. Um, so this is actually laid out uh, for a researcher who will be coming uh, later this afternoon. Um, actually, the, the, the researcher is the architect of, of uh, our own building. Um, her name is Brenda Levin. So I'm not sure what project she's working on now, but we're really excited to welcome her uh, back to the, the ADNA Museum. That's great. So, um, you know, I think it's incredible. How, how did the university come about um, having such um, one of the largest collections of, of um, you know, architectural history? How did that happen? Say, why Santa Barbara versus LA or, you know, Stanford or someplace? That, that's a great question. And because I think you it, don't have you don't have an uh, architectural school at, at the university. We don't. We have yes. a uh, we have a history of architecture, art and architecture department and some amazing architectural historians here uh, on the faculty. But you're right. We don't have an architectural school like, you know, Cal Poly uh, San Luis Obispo, which mm -hmm. would maybe be one of the closest. You know, this all really uh, owes to the uh, forward thinking uh, and kind of visionary uh, thinking of our originating director, David Gebhardt. And he, uh, you know, passed away. Uh, I, unfortunately, I never had a chance to meet him, but he not only taught many, uh, you know, architects who are still in and around Southern California, but he was an avid uh, proponent of uh, their archives and the legacy that architects uh, create. Uh, and Great. I think part of the, the visionary thinking was, well, where will these archives reside? You know, what will be this legacy in the long term? And my understanding is that he was, and I mean this in the best way possible, coming from a, I'm literally standing in an archive, um, he was a bit of a hoarder and he was collecting, you know, copious amounts of materials. I, I know that there are stories of architectural drawings in his, in his bathroom um, and all, all throughout his, his, <laughs> his home, a different type of uh, interior decorating, if you will. Right. And uh, in 1963, I believe that there was a, a large um, maybe purchase that was also made. Uh, and since then it has re really become this repository and continues to grow over the last, uh, well now 59 years, but actually next year will be the 60th anniversary of the architecture and design collection and we have some fantastic shows lined up that will really showcase the, uh, the strong suits, some of the best things that, that are here, but also the work of uh, our curators and how architecture continues to be you know, rethought and, and reimagined. Um, right. uh, our uh, curator of architecture uh, here, her name is Sylvia Perea, is working on a fantastic project for fall of uh, 2023. This will be with the architect uh, Elena Aruete, uh, uh, the first project of its kind. So really amazing uh, things in store for next year that will uh, share the treasures of the ADC with uh, Southern California and hopefully the world. That's great. You know, one, I, I told you when we met that I was rather embarrassed that I didn't, after um, living uh, part-time and partly full-time in Santa Barbara for over 30 years, I was unaware that the university had a museum. And so I thought it was important that we, um, you know, expose our viewers and give more visibility to the museum. And, you know, for me, um, specifically the um, architectural records. And um, I had a dear friend, John Elgin Wolf, and mm -hmm. his partner, Robert Wolf. And uh, John Wolf was sort of known as the father of Hollywood Regency architecture. Okay. And I remember when he, when the archives, uh, when they donated the archives to the university, but was unaware of the, the vast collection that they had. So and if, I'm sorry, I, I was just going to say, I believe he's also one of the co-authors, no, of, uh, with David Gephardt on that really important uh, sort of compendium of, uh, architecture in, in Southern California. I, I believe it's still in print, maybe in its sixth edition. Uh-huh. 
Yeah. So if we have viewers watching um, that are interested in these architectural records and plans and so forth, um, how do they go about accessing these? Games? You know what? Uh, it's, it's as easy as going to our website. Uh, you know, this space that I'm in, uh, actually, I'll, I'll just show you very quickly, the, literally the archive, so you have a sense. I mean, this down here is probably, this is the intake space, and you can see going down the hallway, this constitutes roughly, mm, I would say, less than a third uh, of, of our holdings. There's a, uh -huh. another major uh, storage space on site. But we are open to the public. Uh, and so it, it, you really just need to go onto the museum's website. I believe it's www.museum.ucsb.edu. Uh, and uh, you can make an appointment if you want to come in person. But you're also uh, welcome to, you know, if you know the materials that you're looking to uh, request, you can reach out to us by uh, email, and you know we we're now in the in the digital age. So like you can materials do a PDF. Are, exactly materials are being scanned, being sent over. There's actually uh, was an influx of uh, requests during the pandemic. You know, a lot of people uh, over the past two years were were stuck at home, and they were interested in learning more about their homes. And so we actually had many many requests. Uh, from architects, from homeowners wanting to know about uh, the properties that they have. And so there's an amazing amount of uh, architects' archives here, but also, you know, other materials that, that not only researchers, but also, um, you know, just your, your average uh, uh, architectural aficionado would be interested in. So, um, you know, an open welcome to your viewers to reach out to us either uh, digitally or also to come up to beautiful Santa Barbara and make an appointment and visit us at the uh, ADC. Right, and I think um, in the next couple months, I had talked to you briefly about this. I'd like to have Daryl Wilson, who's my associate, talk to the director of the architectural department because yes. um, Daryl um, has a, a master's in architecture from Princeton and that's his background. And I think he'd be ideal and I think it'd be really interesting to delve into this a little more because I think there's just um, these records are, his, you know, not just historically, but just fascinating. And just what you showed us was interesting. We, we, we would, we would, well, we're looking forward to that. I've already mentioned it to Sylvia. Okay. Uh, and I, I see that uh, our uh, illustrious academic co uh, coordinator, Sophia McCabe, is also on the chat. And she just put all of the contact information uh, for the ADC, for, for any of your viewers who are interested in accessing the archive. So uh, oh, good. Th thank well, you, Sophia. <laughs> thank you, Sophia. So why don't we, um, should we take a trip into the museum sure. now? Sure, it's literally, you can see it's just behind me. Uh, I right. will, uh, apologies for, for the movement. I know that uh, this is not the most graceful uh, of ways to segue well, from, from one space to the other. <laughs> I, I like seeing activity. My background is static. Yours is a little more interesting. And, and you see the sort of uh, the, the installation <laughs> access. But uh, we have three exhibitions on view right now, two of which are of the permanent collection. Uh, and the other, which I'll be speaking about today, is the uh, Ishiglinsky exhibition, which is titled Upon a Jagged Maze. Um, and you have, as you first walk in, this uh, uh, amazing piece uh, titled Coral Snake versus King Snake Jacket. And you know, on, on the photo here, Gabe, you have no sense of the scale of this piece. It's absolutely, it's, it's an enormous piece. I, I will try and flip this around. And uh, so you can see this, this is another amazing piece just behind me titled Spitfire. But to give you a sense of the scale uh, of the jacket and the jacket, right. by the way, is, um, was recently acquired by the Hammer Museum uh, in Los Angeles. So uh, mm -hmm. we are very fortunate to have this loan from them. But to give you an idea, here is the, uh, the, the sleeve and, and here's, here's my hand <laughs> for scale. Great, great. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's about, I mean, it's, 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 it's at least, uh, you know, uh, more, more than 12 feet tall. <laughs> right. It's a very impressive piece. I was, uh, I thought it was just stunning walking into the museum and, and seeing this piece. So tell us a little bit about the construction of this piece and the history of it. 
Sure, uh, absolutely. Uh, so I'll just start really briefly by telling you a little bit of background on the artist, Mishi Glinsky. Yes. He uh, is uh, of the Thana Otham Nation. He was born and raised in Tucson, Arizona. But he's really, uh, not really, he's lived and worked here in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, here I say kind of the Southern California region uh, for the last 16 years. And this is his, uh, believe it or not, first museum solo exhibition. And it's really a part of my vision for the ADNA uh, museum, you know, to feature artists that are from the region, to have a kind of regional identity, but also have a more global scope uh, in, in our approach. And uh, if we can give artists uh, like Ishii uh, first uh, solo exhibitions and, and showcase an amazing body of work. I mean, this exhibition covers from uh, 2009 until the present. Uh, I, I really think that that uh, hopefully will be our strong suit going, going forward. In terms of contemporary art, um, obviously our, uh, the permanent collection, uh, the exhibition to my right actually is uh, medals and plaquettes from the Renaissance. Uh, and then there is a permanent collection show uh, to, to my right that is uh, a, a kind of a mixture of uh, historical materials and contemporary materials looking at uh, notions of serenity and stillness in what I think we can all agree is a very chaotic world. But the piece behind me, uh, Coral Snake versus King Snake Jacket, you know, more than anything uh, beyond its, its scale is really a, a, a monument to uh, resilience. And you can see a number of uh, monikers and, and also uh, uh, symbols that are in patches that are on this oversized biker jacket slash, you know, punk jacket. Um, and each of the, uh, the uh, patches represent, represent uh, ongoing movements uh, within um, Native American uh, culture. And these are multiple, various cultures. So for example, if we look at, uh, I will just turn this around very, very briefly. Um, you know, looking at this symbol here, uh, which is uh, close uh, and near and dear to Ishii's, um, Ishii himself. This is known as the kind of man in the maze uh, symbol of the Thana Otham nation and really is a uh, analogy for one's uh, movement through life uh, and also becomes a, a kind of uh, placeholder for the exhibition itself. The exhibition being a uh, early career survey, you know, this is uh, as, as this kind of individual walks through uh, the maze, the maze being a metaphor for uh, one of many meanings, the metaphor of one's journey in life, the kind of circuitous path that one takes when you get to the center, you, um, you look back in retrospect to see all of the decisions that have brought you to this place in space and time. And that, if anything, is really what a, a survey or an early career uh, retrospective is. Um, and so it really is, is a beautiful metaphor for what this exhibition is. There are also other uh, symbols that are mixtures of um, pop culture motifs, but also movement, important uh, Native American movements. Uh, AIM, which is the American Indian movement, started in uh, Minneapolis, uh, of, of all places, in 1968 and continues mm. to the present day. Uh, this is their uh, kind of historic patch, but then you can also see uh, this is a symbol uh, for those of you, your viewers who are um, punk rock uh, aficionados, that is the symbol for, for the band, the Dead Kennedys, but transformed into AIM. So a big part of uh, Ishii's work is playing with scale, bringing these movements uh, and, and this, this culture to a, a larger audience. Um, aspects of which, you know, unfortunately have been overlooked by, I'd say, both the Western canon, uh, art history, but also, um, you know, sort of white general audiences in general. And so uh, having that be uh, something that, you know, in a space like this that you can't miss, I mean, literally, you see it sort of towering over me. Um, and that happens throughout the show. You know, scale gets played with in, in really beautiful ways. Right. So... Can we just for a second talk about the importance of um, when you're visiting a museum or an exhibition, um, either doing an audio tour or having a curator with you? You know, if, if I were just to walk into this, if I last Saturday when I met you, 
walked into the museum, looked around at these different pieces. Let's take this one, for example. I'd have looked at the different symbolism on it, and you know, it's a, an immensely impressive large scale. I would have missed all the history, the symbolism. I wouldn't have known this. So people who are visiting shows, um, do you recommend that they um, get a docent or do audio tours? You know, I, I, I do, I, I think, uh, but at the same time, I think as a, so this is, you know, we are a teaching museum. Um, we had the pleasure of working with a graduate student uh, in our public history uh, department. Her name is Kendall Lovely. And she, myself and Ishii worked really closely on the labels for the exhibition. There's also, you can see kind of uh, just right behind me in the corner, there's even a key that uh, will walk you through and, and, and kind of provide context for, for each of the symbols uh, that right. are in the jacket since it's such a, a dense piece. But I think you're right, Mark. In, in the end, there, there really is no um, replacement for having a walkthrough either with a curator or with the artist themselves. Um, you know, it, it opens up new, whether they be anecdotal, whether they be, uh, you know, really um, of great significance, it opens up new stories mm -hmm. Uh, and also new uh, pathways of understanding for, for these objects. But our hope is, I mean, in no sh way, shape or form are, is this exhibition or the objects in it a mute in any way. They, they are anything but. They really grab you, bring you into uh, mm -hmm. a, a narrative and a history that is, is ongoing. Um, and I, I think that's what one of the beauties of uh, Ishii's practice. But I hope too, you know, you could come back to this exhibition uh, again and again you know, once seeing it maybe on an aesthetic level, um, which is quite impressive on its own, but then, you know, coming back or spending more time and delving into the labels, which really unpack the context um, and the rich uh, history and uh, traditions which continue to this day related to uh, the specific objects. I think a, a great case in point is uh, this piece in front of me, which is titled uh, Poblano 1978-21. And this is a reference to uh, the, the Zuni artist uh, and jewelry maker. Her name is Veronica Poblano. Uh, she continues to make uh, exquisite pieces uh, to this day and is, is very, her work is very much sought out and, and sought after. But, you know, again, for scale, I don't know if you can see, here's my hand. This, this right. thing is about, That's you know, very th yes. three, three feet uh, in, in dimension. These would normally be you know, a, a, a brooch or a pin that would go on um, one's uh, garment. And so Ishii is once again playing with scale. He is expanding right. this so you, you take notice of something that, and also an art form and maybe, maybe you know, if we're talking about inlay uh, and jewelry as an art movement, uh, these are known as Zuni tombs. Um, you take notice of, of the thing, um, but in this work in particular, the way that it's titled Poblano, he is also referencing his own personal, you know, friendship, his relationship to the original maker. Um, this piece is actually, uh, I don't know if it's one-to-one, -one, but it is modeled after a work that Veronica created herself. And then Ishii has, and there are, are works in the exhibition as, as I walk into it, uh, the, the main gallery, you know, other right. inlay works that I'll show you here. Oh, good. These I are, wanted you to show those. Yeah. These are original works uh, by Ishii, uh, but also, you know, working off of the inlay uh, form. And so everything you see here, believe it or not, is uh, poured resin. Uh, this is a great example. You know, in the original, uh, this pearl essence would have been a mother of pearl. The red would have been coral. Uh, the green at the top would have been tur turquoise. And so all of these very precious uh, stones, precious uh, materials, Ishii has now rendered uh, in, in resin and also enlarged uh, to, again, bring attention to, to this um, art, art form. This piece in particular with Snoopy is titled Geronimo, um, which even uh, Ishii's titles have these additional layers of meaning, you know, Geronimo uh, being a, an important uh, Apache uh, war uh, uh, or Apache leader, um, and it also being appropriated by the U.S. military as a, a war cry. Um, so all of these layers of meaning are very much um, front and center uh, for, for, for Ishii, and, and we've tried uh, to, through labels and through kind of contextualizing the, the show, to make it more accessible to, to a general public. Sure. 
Are you able to show the two figures that are in oh, yes. the uh, okay. center of the room? Because I yes. just, uh, I love those two pieces. They're right behind me here. Uh -huh. uh, they're titled Reigning Warriors. And I believe, you know, other than for maybe, I think Ishii had said, uh, maybe for only a few hours at a, at a trade show, these are the first time these are ever being shown public. Uh, and this, okay. again, is is kind of one of the joys of being uh, a curator and working directly with living artists. Um, we had originally seen these in Ishii's studio. Uh, and they are these, these two, uh, you know, amazing figures uh, with these bespoke garments on them. Um, but like the jacket, they're also this uh, mashup of tradition and current uh, practice. So interestingly, and you can see that they are, uh, they are on AstroTurf, um, these figures are titled, this piece is titled Raining Warriors, rain like uh, the weather. Um, and Ishii, as I had mentioned, is of the Thana Awesome Nation. And that is of, you know, the Arizona, the, the Sonoran Desert. And if they, if individuals were participating in a powwow there, uh, and it actually did start to rain, um, everybody would really need to go seek shelter, whether it be from uh, flash floods, whether it be from lightning, uh, it could be quite dangerous. Um, but Ishii had seen on social media uh, a pair of individuals also at a powwow, but here in uh, Long Beach, and they were uh, performing. And uh, during their performance, they, it started to rain. Uh, and, uh, you know, instead of stopping what would, be, would have been most familiar uh, to Ishii, uh, these individuals put on trench coats and just kept rocking out. And this is a kind of homage uh, to that experience. Um, these are bespoke jackets that Ishii has made. Uh, you can see the beautiful kind of embroidery on the back. Um, while these uh, figures are, are kind of Ishii's own creation, uh, the astroturf turf at the bottom is a nod to the, the original grass dancers that he saw. Uh, but as you look through this, there are elements, you know, here's the LA Dodgers symbol. Yeah, isn't there a reference on one of them to a, a Gucci symbol? There is up here. I found that amusing. Le le right. leave, it to, leave it to Ishii for these to also be absolutely <laughs> couture. Uh, uh -huh. You have uh, the, the Gucci uh, label over there. I think then, you know, but they're also not above Nike. We have Nike over right. here as well. Mm -hmm. But in beautiful, you know, hand-done beadwork. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's a nod to his, his biography, uh, his, his personal experience, but also um, these uh, traditions that continue to the present day in mul multiple uh, uh, communities. You know, I think a big part of Ishii's practice is speaking to these issues intertribally. Um, there are lots of works in this exhibition, uh, say, for example, these baskets over here that very specifically reference uh, Fauna Otham uh, uh, traditions, whereas other pieces, whether it be these beautiful necklaces, uh, these reference uh, the Santa Domingo uh, tribe in, in Santa Fe, uh, and what is known as battery birds uh, that they, they, they create. This, this piece is actually so big, it's, it's quite hard to, to give you the whole sense of the scale. Right. Mm -hmm. And so all told, there are, I believe, 25 objects in this survey exhibition. Okay. Uh, and there's also 17 lenders. Uh, these works come from all across the United States. We have two institutional lenders. As I mentioned, the jacket comes from the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles. And uh, a, a few other pieces come from a, a really uh, very exciting uh, space and project in upstate New York called the Forge Project, which is focused uh, solely on contemporary Native American art. Um, I see uh, one of your uh, viewers references, you know, asks, do the reigning right. warriors behind me have a reference to Giacometti? You know, I, I would say uh, they, they absolutely do, uh, as does, you know, the, the jacket has, for me as an art historian has a very clear uh, reference to say Klaus Oldenburg and soft sculpture. And so sure. it, it's, it's not just one thing, it's these multiple references that make um, Ishii's work and the exhibition um, incredibly rich and rewarding. So could we, you know, there was one painting that I was particularly taken with, um, I think it may be behind you sure. or in front of you, the yes. one with the blue, yes. um, which 
Can you uh, talk a little bit about this painting? Yes. I wish, I wish we had more time because there's so many pieces there that are so fascinating. And you know, I, I, it was and very- And I wasn't familiar with Ishii prior to meeting you. Uh, and you know, the hope is uh, with, and the purpose of this exhibition is if you weren't familiar with Ishii uh, and his amazing work, that this is, uh, for some is an introduction and for others is continuing on a, a dialogue of the work he's uh -huh. created over the last you know, 16 plus years. So this piece is titled Custer's Cavalry. It's actually the, probably the most uh, violent uh, work I in the exhibition. It references uh, to a, a Western audience what, the battle of uh, what would be known as Custer's Last Stand. For uh -huh. indigenous uh, individuals, this was known as the Battle of Greasy Grass. Um, and what you have is this scene of, of carnage, um, but it kind of, in, in, as Ishii often does, you know, it kind of transforming into this sort of oblivion of an abstraction, this raw pigment that you have down here uh, and these um, triangular shapes. And, you know, the, the, the label kind of provides context on uh, the historical uh, battle and, and its importance and meaning. Um, but I think even as you experience this in the exhibition space, you know, the, the repetition of these triangles at the bottom is also, you know, repeated by the, the triangles in these individual, in the reigning warriors' uh, stances. And so there are these formal relationships that are happening throughout the exhibition, uh, but there are also uh, really important um, cultural uh, and historical uh, narratives that, that are being um, unpacked uh, for, for our viewers. I think maybe if we have, you know, just a few seconds left, just because this gallery is so, so beautiful. Um, okay. I'll just show this really quickly. Behind me is uh, a tray, handmade uh, out of uh, baling wire by Ishii. Uh, but then these three paintings, all of which uh, in some form or another reference weaving. Um, here is a painting called Peaks and Valleys, which references uh, a Diné blanket uh, weaving and that tradition. Uh, this really just showstopper of a piece yeah, that, here. that's a stunning piece. It is. Uh, this is titled Back to Bear Grass, and it is very much a, um, an homage uh, by Ishii to uh, his, his hometown uh, and, and where he is from. Uh, so the, the weaving that you see, the basket weaving, uh, that you see uh, in the kind of grays and earth tones, uh, that's a mixture of material. The material being bare grass, uh, that was, that's actually the material used for the, to structure the weaving. Uh, but you also have uh, devil's claw, which is used for, uh, to create that pigment. And so that's a reference to uh, his, his um, uh, ancestral and also uh, his, his, where he was born, that home. Um, and then the uh, very beautifully colored, I mean, to get close to this piece, Mark, is, is really something to yeah, behold. Yeah, I know. To see this in person, you know, you lose, you lose a little bit on, on a video looking at something. But this you is do. great because you can, <laughs> you can see the texture. You know, this is all done. In person, it absolutely yeah. looks woven. These pieces look like feathers. It's and, and that's actually what they represent. So the colorful right. part of this, uh, references the uh, the Pomo uh, individual, uh, the Pomo uh, tribe, and uh, they are of Northern California, and that is kind of a nod to where Ishii currently calls home. And this would have actually been done out of um, hummingbird feathers. Mm. And then uh, we're sort of going uh, backwards in time, but this is an earlier piece called uh, Slanted uh, tray, uh, which is, is a really interesting, when you see these in person, uh, kind of antecedent to the, the later uh, paintings. Well, this is great. Thank you. This tour is just fabulous. You know, it's just, I want to give people a taste of what you offered to me last week, because it's a very small museum, but it's a little jewel. Thank and you. the University of California in Santa Barbara is right on the coast. It's one of the most spectacular settings. 
Um, the museum might be a little difficult to find. It took me a few minutes to track you down. <laughs> we can, we but, can work on the wayfinding. <laughs> right, okay. But I, want to, I really want to encourage people to come and, and visit the museum. It really is special. The setting is special. And of course, Santa Barbara is always a, a wonderful um, place to visit. So um, I, I want to still ask you before we have to sign off, I want to ask you your personal taste in art. And what, you know, um, you curate shows. Um, it's always fascinating to me um, how a, a director goes about selecting what the next exhibition, what the future exhibitions will be. So can you tell me, I have two questions. One, I want to hear about what upcoming exhibitions you have. Sure. And then what you um, like to collect personally. Oh, okay. So in terms of shows that we have coming up, which I think sort of touches on uh, your your question of how I you know my taste and how we choose things. So as I mentioned, mm -hmm. next year is the 60th anniversary of the Architecture and Design Collection, um, right. and uh, our curator of architecture will put together uh, you know a, a very an incredibly researched uh, and, and a bit more um, I guess you could say academic exhibition on the the life and work of uh, Elena Aruete. Uh, prior to that. A, a bit more in, in, in my wheelhouse, uh, we are working with uh, an amazing ceramicist. Uh, his name is Christopher Suarez. He's based in Long Beach. And he really, he creates uh, these models of vernacular architecture uh, in, uh, in and around where, where he lives. Uh, and he is currently a fellow uh, in Pomona at a, a ceramic center that they have there and uh, is working on a, a large scale solo exhibition uh, that, that he'll do here in spring of 2023. Um, I was very interested in trying, uh, thinking through, you know, myself, not as an architectural historian, how do we make architecture? How do we make the built environment uh, and also our archives um, more accessible and, more, and, and bring it kind of alive to a general audience? So I hope between the two shows that we'll be realizing next year as part of the 60th anniversary, and there, there are other shows in the mix as well from the permanent collection that will be able to do that. Um, your second question, work that is in my personal collection. You know, a lot right. of that has, uh, has come out of friendships and, and close relationships with individuals. Um, you know, working on projects or doing studio visits and just having, clicking with both uh, the artists and also with their, their, the work that they're making um, and just realizing that there's an affinity, that there's a kinship there and that, you know, uh, would would want to live with one of these objects for for uh, for the duration. Um, right. I you know for example I recently uh, a fantastic gallery in Chinatown here in Los Angeles. Uh, I think it, what was known as Stanley's. It's now um, Sebastian Gladstone. I think is the name. Um, I was there on a whim to see the work of uh, a really interesting artist named Timo Fowler. Um, and that was one of the first pieces that I bought when we returned back to uh, uh, California. We have this beautiful drawing of a uh, Medusa sketch. He creates um, stained glass windows uh, or stained uh, sculptures mm -hmm. made of stained glass window. Um, and so we have a sketch, a preparatory sketch from one of those pieces that, that is our most recent acquisition. Um, but other works in the, our collection are um, contemporary Japanese art, a lot of friends you know, that we've made over the years there. Um, and uh, I think another piece that we acquired recently, uh, just an outstanding individual uh, named um, Igshan Adams. Uh, he mm -hmm. is a textile artist based in uh, South Africa. And I had the pleasure of, of visiting his studio there. Uh, we made a major purchase actually for uh, the Minneapolis Institute of Art. There was a great show that was just at uh, the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, but while I was at his studio, obviously a much more modest piece, um, a piece that both my uh, wife and I really just fell in love with. And so that now uh, lives at our home for the time being. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, that's great. Well, I think our time is up, but I can't thank you enough for sharing this with us today. The museum's a jewel. You're very special. Thank you. Um, oh, the great that's thing so kind about of you. It, a lot of people are so intimidated by art museums, and you're very accessible. You're very real, and I just, I, I you know, I, I feel very honored that you um, were on the show with us today. So thank you so much. 
Oh, the and, feeling is mutual. And I didn't want to show too many things in the museum because I really want to encourage people to come up and see the Ishii show. Yes. Um, and to explore. Is, is the museum, do they have a website? We, we do, and, and I, I believe it's in the yeah. comments uh, earlier, but it's museum.ucsb.edu. Uh, okay. And uh, we would love to have you up. We are always free. Uh, we are open from 12 until 5, Wednesday, Wednesday through Sunday, uh, and would love to have you uh, come visit us here in beautiful Santa Barbara. Wonderful. Thank you, Gabe. This was wonderful. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mark, for the opportunity. Also, uh, my, my hat's off to your team. They, they got me on Instagram Live, which is really a feat <laughs> unto itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, uh, technology is really the harder part of this, isn't it? <laughs> it, 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 it worked flawlessly. So I, I thank them. And then thank you all to uh, the viewers who, who chimed in live. And for any of those of you who will see this uh, once it's archived. So thank you so much yeah, for the opportunity. To remind everybody, um, these, this podcast um, or this uh, talk will be available on our Instagram account, our YouTube account, and it's also available uh, for viewing or listening on our podcast under Mark Weaver and Associates. So um, if you happen to miss this, share it with your friends because I'm sure they'll find it equally fascinating. Thank you so much, Gabe, and look forward to seeing you soon. All right. Stay cool. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.